quick thank you to the folks who both decorated the sanctuary this morning and made sure that this beautiful transformation occurred to the kids who were barely able to carry some of those plants down to the front and also to the amazing music and musicians this morning. Thank you for your contribution to our service. This morning before I began the 9 o'clock service, I asked the congregation uh, that if they would not applaud, there are a couple of spots in the sermon where, knowing you, uh, my guess is that you might have been tempted to applaud, and I asked folks not to do that, and people respected that, and so I asked you again. My partner, John, took me aside afterwards, and he always tries to keep me humble, and uh, he said, Brent, you were making an assumption that they would applaud. <laughs> and uh, I said, I think I know them, and, and so anyway, there's the request. We have had quite the Lenten sermon series. We asked you, what were those questions you always wanted to ask God? We put it out on our Facebook. Folks put it out on Twitter to their friends. And we got questions from all over the place. We took those questions and picked the eight that were the most frequently asked. So the last few weeks have certainly been full of questions and hopefully some helpful ideas. A lot of discussion and some disagreement. Respect for differences. And yet, one church... One church large enough for the questions and the questioners. One church where people from different paths to God have come together to question, to wrestle with tough questions, big questions. One church where we try to love more together, learn more together, serve more together, and where we try to work together to make the world a better place for those who will come after us. And for those across the street, across around the world, and maybe even down the pew from you, people who might feel left behind, not experiencing equality or opportunity, maybe losing hope that life can be any better. Maybe they despair at not being able to overcome loneliness, or poverty, or illness, or addiction, wondering if they will ever be able to find someone who will love them, or find a job, or live a day without pain, or find healing for a loved one diagnosed with an incurable disease. Across the street, around the globe, or maybe just down the pew from you. All of them are our neighbors. All of them are sisters and brothers in this one human family. And certainly today I can't promise you an answer to these challenges, nor will I offer you cliches or pat answers. However, I do offer you this, and I believe it with all of my heart that God has placed you and God has placed them here for a reason. You individually and we collectively as a church have been given this wonderful gift called life for a reason. This gift with its sunny days and its storms. This gift with the cry of a newborn baby or the cry of a family at graveside. This gift with the beauty of a single rose or the ugliness of war. This gift with its moments of awe and wonder and its times of disappointment, even devastation. Each of us have been given this gift for a reason, just as Jesus was also given this gift for a reason. As the story goes, he was born in a manger, son of a teenage mom and a carpenter dad raised in a religious family, and started a religious renewal. He was a leader, a preacher, and a revolutionary. He gathered a motley group of followers, not unlike the congregation this morning. <laughs> he gathered a motley group of followers that went from a few to hundreds and thousands. He took on the political forces and religious fundamentalism. And just as the fundamentalism of his day was killing his faith, the faith that he was born into. That same fundamentalism killed him. And yet, 
it did not have the last word. As the story goes, God had another ending in mind. And whether you believe in the factual basis of the story or not, it is the metaphorical meaning that rises above the fact-fiction debate. For you see, it is the will and the way of God that death should never have the final word. It is the will and the way of God that life here and eternal will win out. That goodness should win out. That love and healing will win out. That justice and equality will win out. For this is the will and the way of God for systems, for governments, for families, for churches and synagogues, mosques and temples. And this is the will and the way of God for you and for me. That life and goodness and love and healing, justice and equality should win out. It was last Wednesday night at 6.35. And I left the church, got in my car, and I drove to East Alternative School on Boltby Avenue for their annual Hero Heroine Night. Twenty-seven grade eight students had each chosen a hero heroine, had to defend them in front of the class to make sure that they passed as a hero, then had to research their speeches and their books by that individual they had chosen. Then they had to write a speech in that person's words. They then gathered together as a class to merge their speeches into one interwoven 90-minute dramatic presentation. Parents, friends, teachers, past students packed the room. And for the first time, two of the heroes were in attendance. No hero had ever attended before. Most were long since dead. Some were busy living in other continents. And some were just plain busy in the White House. In came the students. Remember, grade 8 students. All dressed in black, each carrying a cut-out drawing of the face of their hero. Some of those names you might expect to hear. They were Harriet Tubman, Stephen Lewis, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Simon Wiesenthal, Tommy Douglas, Joan of Arc, Nellie McClung, Abraham Lincoln, and then Brent Hawks. One of the students, one of the students had emailed his pastor, inviting him and his partner to come and see him perform as Gandhi. And he said the students were all excited because this year, for the first time, one of the heroes was going to attend. And he put in his email, Brent Hawks, in large caps with exclamation marks after it. One by one, two by two, group by group, they rose up to give their speeches and interwove their words of freedom and justice and equality. Words spoken in ancient times about equality for people in France, mixed with words about equality for Jews and women, people of color and gays and lesbians. Words from different heroes and heroines from different centuries, different parts of the world, and yet they were woven together and they spoke with one voice about the freedom to live and love, about equality and justice, and about the dream for a better world. When the young woman who had chosen my name walked to the center to give her main speech, she talked about weddings and bulletproof vests, and she used my words to talk about our freedom to live and love, our desire for equality and justice for ourselves and our family members and about my dream for a better world. 